Welcome back to another episode of the CSK8 podcast. My name is Jared O'Leary. Each week of the podcast alternates between an interview with a guest or multiple guests and a solo episode where I unpack some scholarship. This week's particular episode is a solo episode where I unpack the paper titled Understanding Women Modders Using the Serious Leisure Perspective. And it was written by Nicoletta Tancred, Selen Turke, Nicole Vickery, Petta Wyeth, and Anna McComb. Apologies if I mispronounced any names. This paper is actually available for free, and you can find a direct link to it in the show notes by clicking the link in the description or by visiting jaredoleary.com. So if you're interested in reading this particular paper, make sure you check out the show notes so you can dive into this a little bit deeper. All right, so here's the abstract for this particular paper. Quote, Modding, the act of custom creation in video games is a large enterprise comprising millions of people. Despite the large number of individuals creating mods, our understanding of who modders are and their motivation for modding is limited. This is especially true for minority groups, including women. In prior research with modding communities, women modders were consistently underrepresented. Using a mixed method survey, N of 68, that incorporates a serious leisure framework, this study begins to unravel women's participation in modding activities. We begin to identify who women modders are, examine what motivates them to mod, and investigate their modding practices. Results show that women modders value the creation of multiple mod types, including cosmetic, environmental, and gameplay modifications. They are primarily motivated by self-gratification and enjoyment. These findings create new insights into how women interact with gaming environments, as well as identifying those aspects of the experience that motivate women's engagement in modding." End quote. So that was actually a really good abstract in terms of it adequately summarizing the main gist of this particular paper. If I were to summarize this paper into a single sentence, I would say that this survey investigated motivations for participating in modding practices among women. So you might be asking, well, what exactly is modding? So an example of a mod is when you take a video game, or maybe even some software, but in this case, a video game, and you change it to do something different. So for example, I proposed to my wife by modding the video game Minecraft. So what I did is I added in custom armor and weapons. They were all color purple, which is her favorite color. I added in our dogs into the game. So instead of having wolves, there were four different variations that all made different sounds that were kind of like unique to the characteristics of our dog's behaviors and whatnot. And added in some achievements and quests that my wife went on in order to eventually craft a circle of hearts, which created a box that had the ring inside of it. So all of this was not in the original game Minecraft, so I had to add it into it by changing the code and changing some of the asset files in it. And that is different types of modding that I used in order to do that. So modding is actually a fairly common practice that is pretty underrepresented in terms of research that's being done on it. However, I've already done three unpacking scholarship episodes that talk about modding. So if you want to check those out, make sure you look at the links in the show notes. So in their introduction, the authors mentioned that modding is fairly common, but there's not a lot of research on it, especially in underrepresented groups like women modders. So to explore this, they had three research questions for this, and they are, who are women modders? What motivates women modders to mod? And what do women modders modding practices look like? For example, what games are they more likely to mod and what types of mods do they create? So in the introduction, they provide three quick answers to each of these questions. And so the first one, who are women modders? They respond by basically saying, there is not a typical women modder. For the second question, what motivates women modders to mod? Here's a quote from page two. Quote, unlike previous studies that included mainly men, we found that women tend to mod for personal enjoyment and rarely mod for financial or social reasons. While some women engage in modding as amateurs, embracing professional practices and establishing a public profile, many others are dedicated hobbyists. Modding for these makers and tinkerers provides an avenue for self-expression and personal fulfillment. Many embrace the acquisition of knowledge for its own sake." And their quick answer to the third research question, which was, what do women modders' modding practices look like, is that it's a range of modding. So I'll unpack each of these a little bit more a little bit later in this episode. All right, so the background section of this paper is divided into a few different subheaders. So one of them is modding and modders. The next one is modder motivations. The next one is women modders and their motivations. And the last one is serious leisure framework and modding. So the authors note that modders typically have two main characteristics. Here's a quote from page two. Quote, they love the games they mod and they want to change how the game is played, end quote. 
Modders are motivated by wanting to have fun playing and modifying a game to make it their own version or entirely new game, and also experience motivation through social, creative, and personal means, at least typically speaking according to the research that they are summarizing. So although few studies have investigated women's interests and motivations in modding, some prior studies found that a, quote, Passion for modding seemed to shift the young girls' focus from pursuing art and fashion design to learning computer skills and wanting to pursue an IT-centered career, end quote, from page three. So there's a range of reasons for participating in modding or motivations for participating in modding. And prior studies that have investigated women's interests has found that it has shifted interest into computer science and IT-related fields. All right, so the next section outlines the serious leisure framework, which is a framework that I wasn't familiar with until a few years ago when I happened to write a chapter for a music making and leisure handbook. So this particular framework is useful for understanding the ways that people engage in subject areas or hobbies or whatever for leisure purposes. The authors summarize three types of leisure. So one is serious leisure, the next is casual leisure, and then the third one is project-based leisure. So here are some quotes that kind of unpack each of those three. And these are from page three. Quote, serious leisure. A commitment to an amateur, hobbyist, or volunteer activity where an individual can improve and express their skills, knowledge, and experience of the activity. As the activity is sufficiently substantial, interesting, and fulfilling the commitment is long-term. End quote. And by the way, here's a quote that kind of explains the use of the word serious. Quote, the use of the word serious is meant to embody a sense of sincerity and importance in the hobby activities. End quote. So it doesn't mean like if you're having fun and like being jovial about something, then it's not considered serious leisure. Nothing related to that at all. Okay, so here's a quote for casual leisure, also from page three. Quote, an intrinsically rewarding activity that requires little training to enjoy. While pleasurable, the activity is relatively short-lived. End quote. And here's a quote for project-based leisure. Quote, a creative undertaking that is fairly complicated, infrequent, short-lived, and completed during an individual's free time, end quote. So looking at modding through this framework, we could say that modding could occur from a serious leisure perspective, a casual leisure perspective, or even a project-based leisure perspective. Going back to my initial example of modding the game Minecraft to propose to my wife, it was not an example of serious leisure. It was not an example of casual leisure. It was instead an example of project-based leisure. So it was short-lived. I spent a few months working on it whenever she would leave the house. And I completed it in my own free time. And then after proposing, did not modify that particular mod because I wanted to keep it intact. So that particular example is an example of project-based leisure. However, if I had continued to engage in more mods, then it could become an example of casual or serious leisure. The authors in this article note that many people often describe modding as participatory, which is the framework that I talked about a couple of weeks ago in the Unpacking Scholarship paper by Jenkins et al., which I'll link to in the show notes. While other authors will also describe modding as a hobby. So here's a quote from page three. Quote, Hobbies are considered as serious leisure activity where an individual voluntarily partakes in an activity in their free time. End quote. All right, so summarize the background. They're basically saying, hey, there's a lot of information on modding and modders, but there's not a lot of information on women. And there's also not really an application of serious leisure framework in relation to modding practices. So they hope to explore that in this particular article, which I think is a neat idea. All right, so the next section of the paper is the methods, and I'll summarize it fairly quickly. So they sent out a survey and received 483 responses, and they used 68 of them from women. So in this survey, they asked for demographic information, they asked for information on experience with modding, the types of mods people created, and some reasons for modding. Which, by the way, in case you haven't heard the previous episodes on different mod types, here are some mod types that were mentioned in this particular paper. So one is cosmetic mods, which change the way something looks. So for example, when I put our dogs into the game, I made four variations of the wolf and made it so that it was basically changing the way that the wolf looked. That's an example of a cosmetic mod. An environment mod changes the appearance of the environment itself. So an example of that in the mod that I use with my wife is I added in these purple ore blocks that made some interesting sounds and that gave purple ore that she could use to craft her different armor and weapons and whatnot. So that was changing the environment by making it so that a new type of block appeared in the game. 
Now, a total conversion mod is a type of mod that completely changes the game into something different. So, for example, you could turn a first-person shooter game into a role-playing game. Another type of mod are add-on mods, which are mods that enhance the experience. So, an example that you might be familiar with if you play MMOs, like World of Warcraft, is you can have add-on mods that can keep track of stats in a raid. So it'll tell you who did the most damage, what your average damage minute was, how often you healed, etc. Another type of mod is gameplay mods, which enhances the gameplay in some way, such as giving characters new abilities. So going back to the mod that I used to propose my wife, if you watch the video that's in the show notes, you'll see that I added in like new items like tofu and things like that, because we're vegan, make it so she could cook with tofu. Another type of mod that the authors mention are sex or sexual mods, which are mods that add nudity or sex acts to a game. So a common one that is often referred to is in the game Sims, modders have added in things that make it so that the Sims do something they could not do without the mod, and they're related to sexual acts. And the next mod category they talk about are joke or humor mods. So one of my favorite examples that they mention in this particular article is in the video game Skyrim. There's this dragon at the beginning of the game that will attack this little outpost. And somebody modded the game so that instead of a dragon, it was a flying Thomas the Tank engine. So you'd see Thomas the Tank flying around, breathing fire, and making train sounds while basically destroying an entire outpost. It's hilarious. I'll include a link to it in the show notes, as I highly recommend you watching it. And the last type of mod that they mention in this are patches and bug mods that fix bugs in games. All right, so those are the type of mods, and getting back to the methods, they used a serious leisure inventory measure, which they refer to as SLIM, the acronym, to assess responses to a nine-point Likert scale, and then they used thematic analysis to analyze any of the open responses. So if it was like a, write a paragraph about your thoughts on blank, what motivates you as a modder, or whatever, then they'd take those responses and they'd put them into different clusters or categories that they would then label as themes and then summarize it in the actual paper itself. All right, so that's the methods. So let's get into the nitty gritty of the actual results. So demographic wise, who are women modders? So a few of the women respondents were over 50. However, the average age was 29 years old. So most of the women were unemployed at the time of the survey and not students. And they lived in North America, Australia, Europe, and Asia. However, the majority of these respondents listed the United States as their original country of origin. The average years of experience modding was 4.46 years, with only a few rating themselves as extremely experienced modders. And the median number of completed mods per person was 14 mods, while the average was 36.86 mods. So the majority of modders created mods for RPGs like Skyrim, with Stardew Valley coming in second for types of mods, which is a great game if you haven't played it yet. All right, so here's a summary of the mod types that they tended to engage in. So 31 of the mods were cosmetic, 29 were environmental, 26 were gameplay, nine were add-ons, four were joke and humor mods, three were total conversion, two were sex or sexual mods, and two were bug fixes. That's from page five. So the majority of the mods changed the way the game looked or how it played. All right, so the next section of the paper is on the slim analysis. So there were 10 different components that I will now briefly summarize. All right, so the first component is group and unique ethos. Here's a quote from page six, quote, on average, participants have a neutral stance towards being part of a group as their modding motivation, end quote. So it sounds like the respondents were indifferent. Some of them may have preferred it. Some of them didn't like to work in groups and some of them could care less either direction. The next component was persistence and progress. Here's a quote also from page six, quote, overall it appears that women modders feel they are improving their skills, managing obstacles, and rising to the challenges that they face, end quote. I will say as somebody who is new to modding, there is definitely a lot of persistence, but you'll notice a lot of progress when you actually see the things that you create with code or through visual transformations actually appear in your game itself, which is pretty cool and rewarding. So the next component is invigoration and renewal. So women in this survey said that it was slightly gratifying and slightly self-actualizing. The next component is personal fulfillment, which the women who responded to this 
felt that it was a form of personal enrichment to some extent. The next component that is similar to this is enjoyment. And the respondents indicated that most of them modded for personal enjoyment, which makes sense because you're changing a game to do something that you want it to do, which it can be really fun, but also can be frustrating if you're working on a particular bug or function or feature. So the next component is self-expression, which kind of relates to what I was just talking about. And they found that modding helped people to express their identity to some extent. The next component is career contingencies. And by career, and from a serious leisure perspective, it does not mean like, oh, you're going to get a job doing this hobby. It instead means, quote, the stepping stones in a hobbyist practices, end quote, it's from page six. So the participants were able to kind of identify some of those stepping stones that define their involvement with creating mods. The next component is personal abilities. And participants found that they were able to demonstrate some of their personal abilities through modding. The next component is financial return, and here's a quote from page six, where they found that the findings, quote, supports a previous study that found modders are not motivated by monetary gain when it comes to modding, and contradicts assumptions that many modders want jobs in the games industry, end quote. So as I mentioned in other episodes, there are a lot of people who explore modding and how that can serve as a pipeline to get into game-related positions at companies. But these authors are saying, look, some people just want to mod just for the sake of modding because it's fun, not necessarily for a career, which is awesome. And the very last component is effort. So the respondents mentioned that they put considerable amount of effort into their own modding practices, which makes sense because it's not always easy to modify a game. So the next section on the qualitative findings, the authors provide some quotes on the motivations of respondents for modding as well as some case studies on some of the participants. So I recommend checking those out if you want to read those a little bit more. So the last bulk of the paper is the discussion section. So this paper basically summarizes the findings, the stuff that I was just kind of talking about in the previous section. However, one of the interesting findings that I want to point out and highlight is because it contradicts something I've heard as being important is that, quote, we also found that social aspects were not a primary motivation for women. However, our qualitative and slim findings suggest that there are some exceptions, such as an enjoyment of community engagement, end quote. From page nine, here's another quote from the same page, quote, the majority of the women modders either had not worked on a group modding project, 50%, or did not answer the question, 17.6%. Conversely, previous research focusing on men found this to be a main motivator, end quote. So in other words, prior modding research and discourse has talked about how, oh, well, modding can be really collaborative, etc. But this finding was saying, well, about half the people who responded actually preferred to work on their own, which is something that I have also witnessed in like the K-8 classes that I've worked with in the coding classes is I gave the option where anyone could work in any group that they wanted in the classes that I was working with. And the vast majority of people were like, mm, no, I'd rather work on my own which contradicts some of the discussions that I've heard around programming for professional sake, is there's the argument, well, you're always going to be working on a team, so therefore you always need to be working on some kind of group project. And while that might be true for most of the programming that you will see in a lot of larger corporations or even smaller companies, that's not necessarily the case for engaging in computer science and coding for leisure. So something we need to consider is, are the practices that we are modeling in the classroom are they there to support corporate practices or are they also there to support some of the things that kids can engage in when they leave the classroom and just want to do it for leisure? All right, so that's kind of the main summary of the article itself. So now I want to kind of provide some of my lingering thoughts and questions, which is something that I like to do at the end of each of these because there's always something that I want to learn more about or consider on these particular papers that I unpack. So the first question that I have is, what context and data are missing from the open-ended responses to the survey? In other words, if these were semi-structured interviews that had the opportunity to actually ask some follow-up questions, what would we learn that wasn't evident through a survey response? So while survey responses are easy, relatively easy, to gather a large number of responses from different people without having to invest a significant portion of time, it would be interesting to see how the responses would have compared with actual interviews where you could ask some follow-up. Oh, why did you say that? Or what does that mean? Or what are your perspectives on this thing that you're not mentioning, but might be important, etc. And I asked that question not as a knock on the research itself. It's a good paper, I recommend reading it, but just to kind of say, hey, there are some limitations in survey approach, and it would be interesting to see what these findings are if we use some other methods. 
So the next question that I have is, how do these answers compare with the responses from male or non-binary participants who may have also filled out the survey? And what about similarities and differences among other demographics aside from gender? So I'm curious how responses and different categories and types of mods would have changed depending on which demographics you're looking at for this, the respondents in this particular survey. And again, that's just me kind of thinking out loud to say that, hey, it, that would be interesting to know. So the last question that I have is, do participants strongly identify as a female modder or are there are other identities that better align with their interests in modding? And I ask this, if we think back to the chapter three episode of Paulo Freire's book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, where I talk about the importance of dialogue between oppressor and oppressed, and how sometimes you engage in that dialogue of somebody who you believe is being oppressed, and you might find out, oh, they actually don't feel the same way and have a different perspective on it, and it's not something that they are actively interested in changing. So while there might be a limited number of women who are engaging in modding, maybe they don't see that as a problem because maybe that's not an identity that they are bringing to the table when it comes to engaging in modding practices. So for example, although I'm non-binary, it's which is an underrepresented group, an under-discussed group, my gender identity is not something that I think about when I'm engaging in serious leisure or discussing something in an affinity group, such as like a video game affinity group. I'm instead there to talk about the game, not about the game in relation to my gender identity. So in that particular context, my gender identity is simply something that I don't really consider in those contexts. And so I'm raising this question just because I'm thinking out loud and wondering that just because we can explore marginalized identities within a group, perhaps we should ask also whether people within the, those marginalized groups even think about those particular demographics or identities in relation to the engagement in that group. And again, that's just me thinking out loud. I do appreciate anyone who's willing to investigate underrepresentation in any form of groups, but I also just think that we need to engage in a dialogue with them to see, well, does this actually, is this something that's important to that demographic that we're investigating that is underrepresented? And if so, why? And if not, why? And my last lingering thought is, how might we consider leisure when engaging in classroom context? So if we're doing computer science or coding in our classes, are we just preparing for future jobs? Or are we also talking about how people can use these practices and concepts outside of just careers? So for example, if you have some kids who really want to go into, into a career that does not use computer science concepts and practices, but they might want to engage in, in leisure, how could you make those connections for them or help them make those connections? So those are some of my lingering questions or thoughts. And I hope this quick summary of the paper entices you to want to actually read it, which you can find for free. Again, clicking the link in the show note will take you directly to the page. And you can find those by going to jaredoleary.com or clicking the link in the show notes. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing with somebody else or consider adding a review on whatever app you're listening to this on. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen, and I hope you all have a wonderful and safe week.